Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and this is part five of my series on Winfield Scott Hancock. Winfield Scott Hancock and his family left Los Angeles in August 1861, traveled through the Isthmus of Panama and then on to New York, where they took a train to Washington, then to Louisville, Kentucky, where he had been assigned to General Robert Anderson's staff, the defender of Fort Sumter, as his quartermaster. Hancock was at risk of being stuck in the same position as he had been during the Mexican War in the quartermaster department, barely getting out in time to see action. His ability and reliability as a quartermaster was hurting him again, but Hancock had been training and preparing for war since his days in Mexico. While at Jefferson Barracks in peacetime, he had been the protege of General William Harney, a rough Tennessean who Hancock learned to wield profanity from. Winfield had also been immersing himself in military studies, looking into the campaigns of Caesar, Napoleon, Wellington, and Frederick the Great. Some historians have highlighted Hancock as one of the most prepared officers to take field command during the Civil War. Thankfully for the Pennsylvanian, he was sent to Washington, D.C., where George B. McClellan was organizing the army. Both men had gotten to know one another at West Point and in Mexico, and after a several-hour interview with McClellan, Hancock waited in the capital until a position within the army could be procured. On September 23rd, he was appointed to a brigadier general in the division of William F. Smith. Hancock could breathe easy now that he knew he wouldn't be stuck in the quartermaster department. His brigade was made up of the 5th Wisconsin, 43rd New York, and 47th and 49th Pennsylvania. However, the 47th would soon be transferred and the 6th Maine would take its place. Unlike many of the political appointees that outranked Hancock, Winfield knew what combat entailed so he wasted no time in instituting stern discipline within his ranks, knowing that battles could be won or lost dependent on the ability of troops to obey commands. Although he was a tough commander, his men grew to respect him and trust him with their lives. One way that Hancock enforced discipline was through what one historian called one of the most colored and sulfuric vocabulary in the whole army. He had learned this ability from his old mentor, Harney, and Hancock's troops would recall fondly specific eruptions of swear words. It was not all training, but social gatherings popped up all over Washington, D.C. Most of Hancock's friends, who he had spent time with in the capital in the past, were now on the side of the Confederacy, particularly Johnston and Davis. Hancock's democratic leanings made him keep quiet about his political views in case it might impact his military standing, but he never was one to flaunt his politics in the first place. He was discreet for the most part. Elmira and the children rented a house in Washington to be close to Winfield, especially because once campaign started, Hancock knew that they would see less of each other. The couple were invited to a soiree at the White House, where only cabinet members, senators, diplomats, and major generals of the army were invited. Hancock and his wife were the only exception to the guest list, him only being a brigadier general. First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln informed Elmira that her and her family had showed great hospitality to the Todd family on their trips to St. Louis in the past, and this was a way of reciprocating. In the spring of 1862, McClellan had won approval for the Peninsula Campaign, and on March 23rd, Hancock embarked for Alexandria and wrote to his wife that, I am off at last, and it is a matter of great pain to me that I am unable to see you again before we part. God alone knows for how long. I rode all last night, and while I rode, I did not cease to think of how and where all this unhappiness is to end. By April, the Union Army had arrived at Fort Monroe on the peninsula and began their march toward Richmond, but heavy rain bogged down the army. At the siege of Yorktown that incredibly lasted a month, Hancock and his brigade skirmished with the other side but did nothing substantial to single himself out as anything spectacular. In May, at the Battle of Williamsburg, he got the opportunity to display his effectiveness at command. Joseph Hooker's division attacked Fort Magruder, while Hancock's superiors sent Winfield with five regiments to the far right of the Union line in order to occupy a supposedly abandoned redoubt at Fort Magruder. He was accompanied by a young officer on William F. Smith's staff named George Armstrong Custer. After crossing Cub Dam Creek, Hancock took the abandoned redoubt and informed his commander that another apparently abandoned redoubt was about 1,200 yards ahead of his position. Smith informed Hancock that reinforcements would be sent immediately and to take it. Winfield did as he was told, and upon taking the position, realized that from that vantage point, he could see the entire Confederate line and their entire allocation of troops. 
Ahead of his men was another fortified position, this time with enemy troops within them. Hancock called up his artillery and delivered a withering fire into the Confederates who pulled back. Winfield wanted to take that advanced position, but the reinforcements had not made it to the advanced line that he occupied. In fact, Smith sent him a message that he was unable to send the reinforcements and to pull back to his first position. Hancock was irate at the order. Custer observed firsthand the string of expletives that the Pennsylvanian could spew forth when the order reached him. Hancock sent an engineer officer with detailed information to Smith about how critical it was for the brigade to keep the advanced position for the integrity of the entire army's position. Winfield stated in his response that if no response was made in a reasonable amount of time that he would follow orders. He was walking a fine line of insubordination, but he did not want to give up such a strategic advantage. After an hour of waiting, he was about to pull back his brigade, but at that moment, Confederate infantry began approaching his brigade. This was a critical moment for Hancock. If he failed to repel the attack after already being ordered to withdraw, his career could be over through the extreme damage of reputation. The Confederates opposing him were two Virginia regiments led by Jubal Early and two North Carolina regiments led by Daniel Harvey Hill. Hancock feigned a retreat by pulling his men up a hill, but once the enemy got within range, his brigade let loose two volleys. Then he rode up and down his line yelling, Gentlemen, charge with the bayonet! On the order, the blue troops raced down the hill, puncturing many frontline enemy troops and sending them to the rear. With Hancock's presence on the extreme left of the Confederate line, Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston, although already planning to fall back, was forced to by the actions of Hancock. His possible insubordination was forgotten, and McClellan wired the Secretary of War describing Winfield's actions as superb, and the name stuck. Hancock the Superb would be seen in newspapers all over the North. McClellan's army pressed on to Richmond, where Johnston was wounded and replaced by Robert E. Lee. The successive battles are known as the Seven Days Campaign. At Gaines Mill, Hancock's brigade was tested once again, this time being attacked by and repulsing Robert Toombs' brigade, inflicting heavy casualties on the Georgians' men. The Union army pulled back after each Confederate attack, and at White Oak Swamp, Hancock's men withstood a heavy barrage of artillery from Stonewall Jackson's troops and repulsed a half-hearted attempt by the Confederate general who judged the location too difficult to cross and simply went to sleep under a tree. The rest of the campaign saw little to no action for Hancock's men. His total casualties for the Seven Days Campaign was about 200 men, small compared to other embattled units. However, his ambition and standout performance at Williamsburg and Gaines Mill put him ahead in reputation among the Army of the Potomac. McClellan and his army moved back down the peninsula and waited for orders to return to Northern Virginia in Washington, D.C. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland. To educate the world. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian 